We have children's church at this time. If you're a guest here today with children, I don't believe I see any, but you'll follow the pack. You'll end up in the fellowship hall. Brian, you okay, brother? Yeah. Yeah, sure you are. I know you don't like it when stuff like that happens, but God bless you, brother. Aunt Sue, thank you for shifting gears with us and your patience this morning. It's good to see Aunt Sue back. Amen. Amen. Um, I thought I was going to have to play the piano this morning, so I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I know y'all worried about that. If you have a copy of God's Word, I would love to invite you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at two verses or three verses this morning. Uh, no, I just told a story. We're going to be looking at two verses this morning. Uh, I will be reading three verses with you. Uh, and I've titled our time this morning, The Purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Purpose of the Holy Spirit. We have been, uh, we have been in a, a mini-series in a sense that I'm calling it, uh, taking us to uh, where I feel like God was leading us during the summer. And, and some people will say, uh, uh, some of the experts of preaching will say, don't start a series during the summer. Uh, well, I'm going to start a series during the summer. Uh, and uh, we're going to arrive at and spending time with each fruit of the Spirit. And that will probably occur prayerfully, uh, if not next Sunday, the following Sunday, of starting looking at each fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit gives us. Uh, as we travel to arrive uh, at this morning, I want to kind of connect the dots in a sense. And if you remember, we started with the, the promise of the Holy Spirit, where Jesus Christ prayed to the Father for the Holy Spirit to come down. And the Holy Spirit, He did come down at Pentecost. As soon as we left the promise of the Holy Spirit, I shared with you the power of the Holy Spirit. Arriving at this morning, the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you in small group, and probably especially you small group leaders, you realize something and you see something uh, that I don't know that I've ever done before, and that is that this morning's message and tonight's message uh, is the uh, small group lesson this morning. You're going to be dealing with a lot more of the verses uh, that Paul wrote in Galatians 5, but this morning we're going to begin looking at verse 16, 17, and 18 in just a moment. I want to ask you a question to kind of get your mindset. And when you think about the purpose of the Holy Spirit, why did God send the Holy Spirit? I want you to think about that as we continue to navigate during this time. Uh, why did God send the Holy Spirit? If we're a child of God this morning, we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit at the moment of our salvation. We receive the Holy Spirit that indwells and lives within us. In other words, let me just say it as, as easy and as simple as I can. You have Jesus inside of you this morning. Uh, but if you're a child of God, why did God send us the Holy Spirit? You don't have to think real long to remember that last Monday as a nation, as a country, as a uh, city, community, county, you as an individual, you celebrated the freedom that we have that we're able to come under the banner of the flag of the United States of America. Uh, we celebrate what we call our national freedom that we have by living uh, in America. We celebrated that freedom. When you think about the freedom that we have as Americans, well, you, don't, you, you can't really put it all in this category, but I want to share it with you. I want you to think about the liberty that we have as an American in, in, in comparison to the liberty that we have as a Christian. We have freedom in Christ this morning as we sit here at Soldier Bay Baptist Church. When you think about the, uh, the liberties and the freedoms of America, it basically deals with what we're allowed to do. The freedoms that we have, the, the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, et cetera, et cetera, do da do da that allows us to be able to do certain things as Americans. Amen? But it's different with Christian liberty. It's different with the freedom that we have. What do you mean by that, Jason? What I simply mean is Christian liberty or the freedom that we have that we're going to see Paul talk about in just a second. The freedom that we have isn't really based upon what we're able to do. Christian freedom and liberty is, has to deal with everything of who we are. Our being 
as a Christian. And that freedom, that we're, we're given that freedom based upon the Holy Spirit. Uh, when we celebrate that, that we're a, uh, we'll say that we're an American and we'll, 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 we'll poke our chest out a little bit and talk about that we're an American. We live in the land of the home and the free and the brave. And we talk about who we are as Americans and what we're allowed to do as an American. Sir, man, being a Christian is not about who you are. Being a Christian is about whose you are. It's about being a child of God, uh, the Son of or Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now I want you to see where Paul talks about it. We're gonna this morning is gonna be a little bit different delivery for me, so I want you to see some things. Look at Galatians five thirteen. Paul deals with because we've got to deal with some we've got to deal with some truths before we arrive at the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about this in Galatians five thirteen. Paul says, "For you, brethren." have been called to liberty only to only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another so what's going on here I, I if you don't mind i want to share with you what's going on and why why do we have the words from paul inspired by the holy spirit this morning in this book in this epistle titled galatians uh, obviously paul was writing to the church of galatia what is going on I, I really feel like if you don't get this you don't understand and appreciate what's coming and what you read in the book of galatia paul traveled asia minor while paul traveled asia minor he preached one person he didn't preach one thing. He preached one person, and his name was Jesus Christ. And thousands and thousands and thousands uh, uh, received salvation because of the, the gospel message that Paul preached. When he leaves and travels some more, I'm not bogging down with his missionary journeys, but when he leaves, what happens at the church of Galatia is false teachers and false preachers come in to the church. Now watch what they do. They, they degrade his message. So the, what allowed them to, de, to degrade his message, they had to discredit the messenger, which was Paul. And they start tearing him to pieces to the church at Galatia. He's preaching a false gospel. He's not preaching Jesus. In other words, the devil got into the church. Okay. So when word gets back to Pastor Paul, what is going on in the church, Paul says, there's not but one thing I can do. And this is the one thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to pick up my pen and I'm going to write them. And therefore we have the words. And all this is going on with the false teaching, the false preaching that has now entered the church. What is the problem? Well, I'll tell you the problem. Again, if you don't get this, you're not, it's just not going to click. There was a mixture now in the church of not just the gospel message. It wasn't just Christianity. I didn't know it was going to happen this quick. It wasn't just Christianity. It was that of Judaism. It was that mixture that had now gotten uh, into the church there at Galatia. Paul says, no, 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 because he gives them a formula. It's a, it's a mathematical equation that Paul gives them as you read the book of Galatians. And here's the mathematical formula that I'm going to give you this morning that Paul gave Galatia. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. It is not based upon your works. It is not based upon how good you are. It is not based upon the law. It is based upon one thing and one thing only, and that is grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, 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 and you see this thread woven throughout the entire books. The works of the law, and I want to share with you real quick, the works of the law is not a condition of salvation. You cannot be good enough to get into heaven. And, and, and you may say, well, well, Jason, you say that somewhat. You, you say that quite a bit. Y'all, there are people that we meet just about every day that we're in conversations with that really think good gets it. They really do. And, and that's basically you're coming under the law based upon what you do, and it has nothing to do about what Christ did for us on the cross. It's not about being good because if good got it, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. So understand that and know that, and we're going, to, we're going to start putting the pieces together to the puzzle of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Now, I will tell you that works is not conditional for salvation, but I will also tell you that works is part of salvation. 
We're not saved because we do good works, but we do good works because we're saved. How many times have you heard me say that? We say it quite a bit. In other words, you can't come under the law and be saved. There was a time and there was a purpose for the law, but we're talking New Testament. We're talking what's going on then. We're talking about that applies to us today, that the Christian has died to the law. Do me a favor, look at Galatians 2. Go to Galatians 2, 19 through 20. Galatians 2, if you're there, say amen. Listen to what Paul says. I'll give the rest of you a few seconds. Galatians 2, there's only six chapters, okay? You don't have far to turn. Go quickly. Uh, Galatians 2, listen to what Paul says in 19. He says, for I through the law died to the law that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Say amen right there if you're a Baptist. So in other words, the law deals, this is how it helps me in my little pea brain. The law deals with the exterior and self. But what grace deals with is the interior and the Savior. Okay, so that is grace. And we have a, we have a distinct, we have a, uh, we have a distinct comparison between the law and the grace. And that's what, that was some of the problems with the Pharisees. The Pharisees dealt with the law like I eat at K&W. Now, let me share that with you real quick. If you ever, I, I enjoy, Ron and Bethany don't like K&W, okay? I kind of like K&W, I just, don't, I just don't go there often. But when you go to K&W, obviously, you know, it's, it's cafeteria style. And when I go to K&W, man, I want everything, but I don't get everything. I like the roast beef. I like the fried chicken. I get a side or a couple of sides. I get the jalapeno cornbread. Somebody say thank you, Jesus, right there. I get the jalapeno cornbread. No matter what I'm eating, I get the jalapeno cornbread. But see, that's kind of, I got you laughing. I got you listening. Watch this now. That's how the Pharisees dealt with the law. They picked some law. They picked one law. They picked two law. But what they were forgetting is the God that gave them the one law gave them all the laws. We don't pick and choose. Matter of fact, Paul deals with this. Uh, 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 Paul deals with this in Galatians 3.10. Please turn there. Galatians 3.10. He says you don't pick and choose. It's not about the law. It's about the one thing and the one thing only is faith in Jesus Christ. It is grace. Look at Galatians 3.10. This is where Paul deals with it. The Bible says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the cursed. For it is written... This is where he says, you pick and choose. It is not about picking and choosing the law because the law is cursed. Curse is everyone who does not continue in, say it with me, all, in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Let me give you an illustration how the law ends up being a curse. Let's say you're driving down the road, and I know this has never happened to any of y'all. Let's say you're driving down the road and you get pulled over by highway patrol. Okay, I know that's never happened to anybody in here. <clears throat> Just imagine it happens to you. You get pulled over by highway patrol for speeding. You're doing 74 and a 55, let's say. Well, you roll down your window, you give the highway patrolman your license and registration. And you say, what was I doing wrong, officer? And the officer says, you were going 74 and a 55. And you look at that trooper and you say, but I didn't hit anybody. You look at that trooper and say, I didn't cause a wreck. You look at that trooper and say, I'm wearing my seatbelt. You look at that trooper and say, I was driving 10 and 2. You look at that trooper and say, matter of fact, I've never robbed anybody. Matter of fact, you look at that trooper and say, just so you know, Mr. Trooper, I've never murdered anybody. You know what the trooper does? The trooper smiles and writes the ticket. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Because of the one law that you were disobedient of. See, there's not enough of obedience that can make up for your one act of disobedience. And that is the law. Y'all understand what I'm saying? You're picking up what I'm putting down? So the law that you now live by, if you're living by the law, the law that you now live by now becomes your judge. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. Now, if you don't believe me, look at Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verse 4. Galatians 5, verse 4. If you there, say amen. You have become estranged from Christ. The false teachers have went in. The false preaching has gone in. There's a mixture of Judaism and Christianity. 
It's gone in. You've become confused. You've got it all now about the law. Look what's happened. You've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, Baptist, Paul's right there. We'll hear the word fallen from grace, and we will say, not everybody, but we will say, okay, Paul is now telling the church of Galatia that they have lost their salvation. That's not what he's saying here. Matter of fact, if you pay attention to his words and writing and writing in the book of Galatia, he continually calls them brethren. He continually addresses them. He'll go, you, I, and then we, or us. He classifies them as continuing to still be Christians. Falling from grace is not losing your salvation of what Paul is talking about here. Matter of fact, let me give you a modern day. Let me help you. Are y'all okay? Let me help you with this just a little bit. If you're a believer, now I, I love you. If you're a believer here this morning and you truly feel, are y'all listening? If you're a believer here this morning and you think good gets you into heaven, I want to share something with you in love. You're not a believer. If that's what you think, you're not a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason you're not a believer, you may say, well, Jason, uh, I've never killed anybody. Hold on. The reason you're not a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ is if you're basing getting into heaven on what you've done and you go to church and you sing about Jesus, you read about Jesus, you pray to Jesus and all that, what you're saying is that you believe in two saviors, Jesus and you. I want to share something with you with all my heart. There are not two saviors. Even if there were, you wouldn't be one of them. And neither am I, or neither would I be. There is only one Savior, and His name is Jesus. Let me get back up here because the, the, the balcony's crowded. Uh, there's only one Savior, and His name is, say it with me, Jesus. It's about Jesus. That's it. I could have literally come up here this morning. Some of you probably would appreciate it. I come up here and said, Jesus, and gave the invitation. It's about Jesus. Matter of fact, Romans 3.28, Paul says, if we, maintain, uh, if we maintain that man is justified, we main, for we maintain that man is justified by faith, the law, faith alone and not the law. That's what he told the church at Rome. It's about Jesus. C.F. Hogg and W.E. Vine said this in their commentary. I just absolutely adored it, and I want to share it with you. Don't get bored. Don't doze off. Listen to what Hogg and Vine said. They said, Christ must be everything or nothing to a man. No limited trust or divided allegiance is acceptable to him. I want to read that again. No limited trust or divided allegiance is accepted to him. The man who is justified by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is a Christian. The one who seeks to be justified by works of the law is not. There's a battle. There's a constant battle that's going on within you. You don't hear about this battle. You don't hear about this war at Fox. You don't hear about this battle that's going on at CNN or WECT or WWAY or Google. But there's a battle that's going on. And I want to, show, I want to grab your attention real quick this morning, please. Right now, where you're, sit, where you're sitting, if you're a child of God this morning, if you're a child of the King of Kings and the royalty blood of Jesus Christ is running through your veins, I want you to know right where you sit this morning, right where I stand this morning, there is a battle going on. There is a battle that is raging inside of you. What is it? I will tell you, it is the battle between your flesh and my flesh and that of the Holy Spirit. You don't believe me? Galatians 5, look at verse 16. Because this battle that's going on, listen to what Paul says. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit 
against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you, mm, y'all don't, please hear Paul's words inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. There's this battle that's going on, and this morning we're going to see the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And, and that is, I, I truly believe, <coughs> I believe the purpose of the Holy Spirit, here's my first point. The purpose of the Holy Spirit creates a yearning. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in our life creates a yearning. Tonight I'm going to deal with the second point. And I want to go ahead and ask you, Matter of fact, I want to almost beg you to be here tonight, please. Because I want to conclude the purpose of the Holy Spirit tonight, if your schedule allows. I'm just asking, I don't usually do this, but I want to beg you to be here tonight. We'll connect the dots. There's the, power, the purpose of the Holy Spirit creates a yearning that is inside of us. This, this battle uh, that is going on, this flesh and spirit is just like Isaac and Ishmael. This flesh and spirit is just like me and my older brother growing up. I mean, there was this constant battle that was going on. And I want you to understand that when Paul says, I say then, walk in the spirit. Look at 16 with me. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What is the lust? Excuse me. What is the flesh? What is Paul talking about here? Paul was not talking. Listen to me. Lean in. Paul was not talking about the body. The body, our body, is not the flesh that Paul is talking about. Our body is neither sinless or sinful. Our body is neutral. But our flesh is sinful. What is the flesh? It's the old man. It's the old one that's inside of you. And that old self that is inside of you, and we're going we're gonna to unpack this a little bit later on, but that old self that's inside of you is still dealing with the sin that we have in our life because of the state of the fallen world, because of the state of fallen man. That is the flesh that is raging and roaring inside of us. <laughs> When he says walking by the Spirit, he says it. He, he, goes, into, he goes into chapter 1 all the way to ver, uh, chapter 5, verse 16. And everything he says crescendos to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit simply means that if we're a child of God this morning, we have the Holy Spirit. I just want you to get this. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us this morning. And walking by the Spirit means that you're allowing the Holy Spirit to control everything about you, to control what you do, to control what you think, to control what you say, to control how you act and don't react. That's walking in the Spirit. And we're going to continue looking at how do we walk in the Spirit. It's, there's, a, there's what I call opposite appetites that is going on inside of us. And I used, I used, I used the raven and the dove to, 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 to show you what's going on inside of us. In Genesis chapter 8, when the rain stopped after 40 days, what did Mr. Noah do? He raised the window. The Bible says that he built. He raised the window, and then what did he do? He let out a raven. And the raven, the Bible says, the raven went to and fro on the earth, and he kept coming back, and he kept coming back, and then he didn't come back. And the, the raven is what we would call an unclean bird. It is the bird that's going to be feeding off the carcasses and everything. The death, the destruction that's out there. And the Bible is very specific that Noah waits another seven days and then he lets out a dove. And for 21 days, the dove comes back. And I think it's so interesting. I don't know, Mr. Don, I don't know why he says this, but the Bible says that Noah reached out his hand and brought the dove back into the ark. Why, did, why are we told that? I don't know yet. But he, he reached out the window and he brought the dove back into the ark. And after 21 days, he waits another seven days and then the dove flies out and the dove comes back and what was in the dove's mouth? What? What kind? Bible tells, there it is, the olive twig, the olive leaf is in his mouth. 
And then the dove goes back out and then doesn't come back in again. Why is that important? We have raven, the unclean bird. We have the dove, which is the clean bird. The Bible says that no one knew that the dove found somewhere clean to place his feet. There's a raven and dove inside each and every one of us. One's unclean. It's the flesh. And one is clean. And that is obviously the Holy Spirit. And one thing I don't understand is that with this constant battle that's going on, and you know this, I, there's nothing I have said so far this morning that has shocked you. You've known everything that I've preached this morning. It's not really a good sermon. But here's my thing, y'all. If we know this war is raging inside of us, and we know that there's this battle going on, and we know, if you'll allow me just for, for this morning in a sense, if, you'll, if, you, if, you, if you know that there's a raven and a dove inside of you, why do we keep feeding the raven stuff? Does that make sense? Why do we keep giving what we know God does not desire for us in our walk and in our life? One thing I was sharing with someone the other day, one thing I got to thinking about, and you know I'm not a deep thinker. But if at the moment of salvation, if God has given us the Holy Spirit, which He did, and there's this battle going on, that I'm dealing with the flesh. Why didn't God remove the, my fleshly desires? The purpose of the Holy Spirit, and it's like I've said and will continue to say, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make you look just like Jesus as much as the Holy Spirit can in the shortest amount of time that you have here on this earth. So if God wants me to look like Jesus, why didn't God remove the flesh from me? And here's the answer. It's the same reason God put that tree in the garden that he told them not to eat. God desires our obedience. Not only does God desire our obedience, God also desires our dependence upon him. What is our word this year? What's our word this year? God wants us to focus on Jesus Christ. And you get up in the morning, you're either focusing on Jesus Christ at that point, or you're not. And if we don't begin our mornings, if we don't begin our days focusing on Jesus Christ, we've started feeding the raven that's inside of us. And the, we, as long as we feed that raven inside of us, every walk, every word, every thought, we're going to be feeding that raven. And we're not going to be focused on Jesus. And the end result is through that day, you're not going to be walking in the Spirit. And that is some of the purpose of the Holy Spirit that God has given us. Why have I said all that? Because of what Paul said in verse 17. So he, he says, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Because when we walk by the Spirit, do you know what we do? Do you know what happens? What happens is when we walk by the Spirit, we discover, don't miss this, you may want to write it down, and I'm going to try to close here in just a second to be respectful for our small groups. Do you know what happens when we walk by the Spirit? Matter of fact, do you know what happens? Let me do it this way. Do you know what happens when you walk by the flesh? When you walk by the flesh, you're looking at everything through your viewpoint. But when you walk by the Spirit, you're looking at everything through God's viewpoint. Well, Jason, I don't know God's viewpoint. Okay, I love you. That's twice I've said it now, okay? Jason, I don't know God's viewpoint. Well, do me a favor. Cast your eyes in the Word of God, and you'll discover God's viewpoint. Read the Word of God. Pray. When you walk by the flesh, it's all about your viewpoint. But when you walk by the Spirit, it's about God's viewpoint. And when you walk by the Spirit and it's about God's viewpoint, do you know what happens? Number one, you discover. What do I discover when I walk by the Spirit? You discover God's point. When you walk by the Spirit, you discover God's point. Number two, when you walk by the Spirit, you decide. 
what do I decide? I decide God's perspective. I decide God's perspective in whatever it is I'm dealing with, thinking about, or going through. And when you discover God's point and decide on God's per perspective, it is at that point, if you're walking by the Spirit, guess what happens? It's no longer about you. It's now all about God. You're not under your power. In other words, you're depending now on God's power. And I don't know about you, but I love some God's power. Amen. And by the way, you can't walk. You can't walk and rest at the same time. Uh, walking by the Spirit is active. It's not passive. Quit letting the Holy Spirit do all the work. Matter of fact, think about, I, I don't have time to do this, think about all the times the Holy Spirit moved in men and women in the Bible. And what are you going to find? Every time you're going to find they were in action. When we went to Israel, I never, I, I've never flown a lot. But when you go to Israel, you fly quite a bit for an extended period of time. And there was something cool. And y'all don't laugh at me, but there was something cool at one of the airports we got to. There, they now have this walkway that you can stand on, and it'll, that gummit, it'll transport you just as fast as you can keep up, and it'll just slide you right across. Y'all ever seen one of those? It's a flat escalator. And when I first got on it, I stumbled. Stay with me. First got on, I kind of stumbled because it'll, you know, it'll, it'll get. And you got your little, your little, uh, what do you call it, luggage? And uh, it didn't go fast enough for Don and Sonny, so they're walking on the treadmill, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm just gonna rest. And then you know what happened? And all seriousness, you know what happened? I got tired of standing there. You know what I did? Amen. But I tell you what, they should put a speed bump when you get back to the carpet. I'm just saying. <laughs> because the inertia and your equilibrium, when you get to that carpet, I mean, you kind of do like that, right? Why would you share all that, Jason? Because that's walking by the Spirit. What do you mean, Jason? You need to get in action. And guess what? That power that moved me was under me. But when you walk by the Spirit, God's power is within you. He's within you. I am, Aunt Sue, will you come please? I didn't get where I thought I'd get, but, but here's, here's my invitation. This, I'm just, I just want to be obedient this morning. I am somewhat of a weird duck. And what I mean by that is this. I love watching, let me, let me do this fast. I love watching interviews from years ago. It doesn't really matter what. It can be political. It can be Hollywood. I just like old interviews. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I, I mean, <coughs> and, and I, I just go to YouTube. Some spot, I'll listen to it, whatever. Last night, last night, I was watching an interview of, I believe it was 1986, when Tom Brokaw interviewed President Ronald Reagan. And Tom Brokaw was, they were in the Oval Office, and Tom, Tom Brokaw, I, I was just kind of chilling, like I do at a, at a certain time on Saturday night. I'll just chill. And Tom Brokaw was asking President Reagan about his mother. He said, what kind of impact did your mother have on you? And, and Reagan just, he just, he just, I love to hear him talk. It ain't about parties. I just love to hear him talk. He's got that calm voice. Brokaw asked him about something else. And then Brokaw asked, and I thought it was rather interesting, but it was you could do it in 1986. He said, President Reagan, he says, you believe in the power of prayer. He said, I want to ask you a question. He says, has there ever been a moment in time that you prayed to God and He specifically answered your prayer. Ronald Reagan said, well, yes. <laughs> and he says, before I tell you the story, let me tell you this. 
He says, I'm like Abraham Lincoln was. That was president of the United States. He said, Abraham Lincoln says that he couldn't do this job. Talking about being president. He says, Abraham Lincoln said, I couldn't do this job 15 minutes without going to the one that's higher than me for truth and wisdom. I said, wow. Thank you, President Reagan. Jason, what does that have to do this morning? Can I, can I challenge you? I just want to challenge you this morning. Sir, ma'am, you can't live your life 15 minutes as a Christian without the Holy Spirit in the manner and in the mode that God intends for you to. Will you stand? As you're standing, will you bow? Lord, I want to thank you this morning for the Holy Spirit. God, I, I didn't get where I wanted to, but we got where you needed us to. And so, Father God, I pray right now that we have somewhat of a better understanding because of you, Lord, not because of me, but we have a better understanding this morning about this battle, this war that's raging. Father, there may be one here this morning that doesn't even have a relationship with you, that doesn't, the Holy Spirit doesn't even dwell within them. First and foremost, God, I pray for their salvation, that they're saved today, that they have a relationship with you. Lord, that's our prayer. And Lord, for the one that may be walking at a guilty distance, Lord, I pray that they come this morning. Because you stand, you stand right ready with arms open. But Father God, maybe for the believer that's here this morning and has not really been conscious of the battle, this morning, Lord, maybe for the first time, they realize that they actually spend more time walking by the flesh than they do by the Spirit. And this morning, they just want to, they, they can do it right where they are. They want to come this morning and say, you know what? I no longer want to do what pleases me. This morning, I'm going to do what pleases Jesus. Now, Lord, for us to do that, we have to have your power. And we do. Because that's part of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, this invitation is yours. You lead it. You guide it. You stir us. And then, Lord, I ask that we're obedient when you move us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said. Amen. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us this morning with our online services here at Soldier Bay. We were so, we're so glad that you joined us. Here on the screen, you see our email address and our phone number to the church office. Is God dealing with you about something this morning? We would love to pray with you. We would love to speak to you. If we can help you during this time of a prayer concern or, or maybe it's your relationship with the Lord. Maybe it's your walk. Whatever your spiritual need is this morning, please feel free to reach out to us. As always, God is good all the time. Thank you. God bless.